Welcome to Curious Minds and uh, tonight we've got a really good talk for you and I'm very glad to see that we've got a very good big audience here tonight. Thank you for coming out. Okay. Uh, I'm going to give just a very, very short introduction. Right, so this evening we've got Professor Martin Price from our very own Perth UHI. Okay. Uh, Martin has been in Perth since uh, the around about 2000 when he set up the Department of Mountain Studies in, uh, in Perth. He did his first degree in, I believe it was uh, Sheffield, is that right? Mm -hmm. Yep, Sheffield, and PhD in University of Colorado at Boulder. He occupies the UNESCO Chair in Sustainable Mountain Development. Mmm, I hope it's uh, comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> He's worked at uh, Oxford University, University of Bern, Boulder, Colorado. He is chair of a number of European and international committees and working groups. Uh, the UNESCO Man and Biosphere Programme. He chairs the UK committee. And he is chair of an organization called Euro Montana. And I think I should leave that to Martin at some point to explain what that is. But I heard over lunch, dinner that it's an organisation that basically lobbies for the interests of people who don't live in cities. <laughs> and that seems like a decent thing. Uh, he's also the recipient of the King Albert Mountain Medal. And this man, uh, medal is awarded on some basis. Is it annual? Is it every... Every two years. Every two years, biannually. Okay? to people who do something, okay, to promote knowledge, respect for, understanding of mountains. And that's what Martin has done his whole life. And so he's, and that's a very prestigious award. So anyway, at that point, I'm going to hand over to our guest for the evening, Martin. Martin, thank you. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation. And, and I should say that the person who actually invited me sadly isn't here tonight, Des Vassip, who some of you may know, uh, he's not very well. Um, maybe he will watch the video, so maybe that's a good place to start. Um, my talk tonight is titled Why Mountains Matter. And uh, Tom has already introduced where I come from and what I sit on, so I'm not going to go into that any further. Um, my talk this evening is divided really into these two parts. One is the long-term history about why mountains matter, um, and three key values of mountains that I'll go into. And the second is about more recent history. Um, and so that's really the, the structure of, of the talk. So to start with, three reasons why mountains have mattered to a lot of people over a long time. Um, the first is that they are sacred places. They're places that are very special to people in their cultures. Now, I'm starting with this picture of Mount Kailash in Tibet, because if you want to be quantitative, and there's not going to be lots of numbers in this talk, by the way, this is maybe the most sacred mountain in the world, because 1.2 billion people think it's important, because it's important in their religions. Hindus, Jains, Buddhists, and Bon people in Tibet. Why is this mountain important? It's very beautiful, it looks very nice, but perhaps one of the other reasons, which is a more instrumental reason perhaps, that people think it's important, is it's also the source of four of the major rivers in Asia. So if we think about it, it's not just it's a pretty mountain, but it has values uh, to different people. This is a mountain that quite a lot of you will have seen nice pictures of. It usually, you see them looking like that. This bit is snow. It's Mount Fuji. And this is what the top of Mount Fuji looks like if you actually go there, which unfortunately I haven't yet. Um, it's a place which is not only very important from a religious point of view, but it's also very important 
from a tourist point of view, and that's something that has happened to many places, many sacred mountains over time, although, of course, not all of them. And this is one that used to be a sacred place, but now, of course, Machu Picchu in Peru is much more important really as a place for bringing in tourists who really want to understand the old culture of the Incas. So these are three examples of, of sacred mountains, and there are many different uh, sacred mountains all around the world, even in Europe. Um, and there are also sacred forests, for instance, in many places, and the forests are sacred, and again, that protects the water source. So this understanding of holiness uh, and mountain uh, qualities, mountain environment, is, is very important in many places. A second reason why mountains have been important to a lot of people for a long time is that they're places where special minerals come from. And I don't know if we have any geologists here tonight, but the forces that create mountains also create all sorts of minerals and rocks that people are interested in. And I'm using this one because it's a very old story about the value of minerals for mountains, which I was very pleased to find in Edinburgh not very long ago. You can see over on the left-hand side an axe head made of a rock called jadeite. And these uh, axes are made of a rock that comes from those two little places with stars in the Alps, up at 2,000 meters high, so over 6,000 feet above sea level. And what's remarkable is that you can find those axe heads, as you can see, all the way up to here. So these axes were so special, not just for chopping stuff up, but also as sacred things that apparently, if you had one, you were meant to live longer and be healthier. That's the theory anyway. You never know with archaeologists. <laughs> there aren't any in the room. Um, but, um, but these these. Axes of it were very, very important to people, and all those places where you can see green are where they've been found, but all from that one couple of mountains down in the Alps. <coughs> Mineral resources have been very important uh, for bringing mountain areas into global economies for a very long time. And this is Potosi uh, in Bolivia, which is a town that was founded in. 1545, and it's 4,000 meters high. That's about 13,000 feet above sea level. What you can see behind this is called Chero Rico, or the, the rich mountain. And it's called that because it has a lot of gold and silver in it. Apparently now it's more like a Swiss cheese because they've been tunneling into it for such a long time. Some of the silver ore has at least 25% silver in it. So it really is a very, very rich mountain. And at the end of the 16th century, this was the largest settlement in all the Americas. It was the same size as Amsterdam and London. Um, why? Because of silver and gold. But again, if we think about this in the long term, this was showing how important mountains were in the global system for lots of people. But it also brought both positive and negative things to some people. Positive to the people who were getting the gold out, the Spanish. Negative to all sorts of people who were mining it and had to uh, deal with the dust and all the pollution. And the pollution is still going on centuries later, or it's still being mined. And that sort of story continues, that who benefits from these values of mountains uh, at different scales? This is a second example from Colorado, where I did my doctoral research, uh, a picture taken a long time before my research, um, in, sometime in the 1880s or 70s. And this is Pikes Peak, Colorado. The way that people got at the gold was to get these huge hoses and basically spray off all the soil. They also set light to the forests um, so that the, the trees wouldn't get in the way when they, chopped, when they, when they took all the, the gold away. And so, again, this was an example where there was a, a, a very great value of the mountains for those who made some money out of it, but the environmental impacts lasted quite a long time. Although, I have to say, if you go back to this place now, it just looks like a forest, and unless you're an ecologist, you probably wouldn't know that this had happened. Third example of 
the value of, of mountains for minerals comes from Papua New Guinea. And this is the Octedi mine. There used to be a mountain here, which was 2,000 meters high. And um, 2,000 meters high is probably up here somewhere. It's now 700 meters lower. They've taken away all that mountain because, again, it's very valuable. It has lots of gold. It has lots of other different minerals in it. In the process of doing that, they also then had to treat all the, the ore, and they did that with cyanide. Um, that is not something that's very good for, for people. And that cyanide then went down the river into the Fly River. And I'm reading this bit, by the way, because it's the only bit where I actually have to remember some numbers. Um, it affected fisheries and agriculture a thousand kilometers downstream. It affected 50,000 people in villages and destroyed about 3,000 square kilometers of forest. Um, the good news, if you want to call it that, is that the local communities actually took the Australian company to court and sued them for all the mess they were making, and they got some money back. But of course, they'd lost the place where they always used to live, and the environment is going to take a very long time to recover. So the message of mineral resources is that the benefits may be global and to the companies, but the local people often don't gain an awful lot. Third reason why mountains are important is that they are the places where the original varieties of uh, crops, nearly all of the major food crops, come from, except for rice. Um, the example I'm using here is wheat, the, the big picture in the background on the prairies. And what you can see here in the small picture is the original uh, type of wheat which comes from the Middle East in the mountains. And many crops that we are interested in for food and other things come from mountains. Tea originally comes from the mountains. Coffee comes from Ethiopia. Potatoes come from the mountains. And I'm using potatoes as an example because when they came from uh, Latin America, from the Andes in the 17th century, um, they allowed people uh, in the places where they were grown to grow an awful lot more food. And the populations in remote villages all over Europe went up because instead of growing barley or oats or things like that, potatoes allowed a lot more people to live for a lot longer. Uh, well, maybe not a lot longer, actually, but a lot more people to be fed. And this is a story which I want to continue now because this is a, a crop that some of you uh, probably eat. Any guesses? Quinoa. It's, it's a chalice. It's, uh, <laughs> no, this is good for you. <laughs> so this is quinoa. It's an amaranth. Now, quinoa, about 20 years ago, no one knew about it in, in our society. And then it started emerging into health food shops, and now you can buy it in Tesco's. Um, what is important about quinoa is, well, well it's, it's not a grain, but what's important about it, it's highly nutritious, and it grows in very marginal environments. And that's important if we think about a growing population on our planet, uh, maybe it's important to have types of food sources that will survive uh, in difficult environments and be healthy, provide healthy food for us in the long term. Finally, this is a, another crop that probably none of you have ever eaten. I have recently because I was in Peru. It's called Uyoko. And it looks like potatoes, but it's not really like potatoes. My wife has actually eaten some of this because I brought some back. Um, but it is, again, very nutritious, high in protein, grows in all sorts of uh, difficult places. And just like quinoa, which is now built, uh, grown all over the world, and potatoes a few centuries back, these crops from the mountains may really help in the future as our population grows. So that's really the, the message about these three long-term values of mountains. Uh, sacred mountains, um, places where minerals come from, and places where crops come from. So now I'm going into the, the recent history. And I'm starting in the 1970s, 
And some of you may remember that there was a UN conference on the human environment in Stockholm in 1972. Um, why have I put that in grey and the others are all in black? The reason is that at that meeting, mountains were not on the agenda at all. So it's a kind of worth mentioning, but mountains weren't really on the, on the, on the agenda. However, a year later, mountains started to emerge onto global agendas. And uh, UNESCO, the Man and the Biosphere Program, which as Tom mentioned, I'm still involved with, started a project looking at <coughs> how people interact with mountain and tundra ecosystems, mountain and Arctic e ecosystems. So bringing together scientists from all over the world to do comparative research so that we could increase our knowledge, but also compare what was going on in different places. And five years later, the United Nations University, another UN organization, uh, established a pro program on highland lowland interactive systems, again emphasizing that what happens in the mountains isn't only important there, it's also important downstream. Remember the stories from these polluting mountains up high, which have been mined. So highland to lowland interaction is a something that we should really be thinking about. In 1981, a journal was established to, bring, to start to bring together all the knowledge on, uh, that scientists were developing on mountains around the world. Uh, it was a journal called Mountain Research and Development. Uh, you can see that's my personal copy of volume one, number one, which is still on the shelves in my office. Um, and that journal still exists. Um, however, it's now completely online. You, you don't get paper copies anymore except for a few special issues. Um, so that's something that's happened in the meantime. And just to say, perhaps, is that this is now not a, the only mountain journal. Uh, there are now three major global mountain science journals, which has shown the interest in mountains that has developed over the succeed, succeeding years. In 1983, uh, an organization with a long name, the International Center for Integrated Mountain Development, INSIMOD, was uh, established in Peru. Um, what's interesting about this organization is that it's an organization for all the Himalayan states. And the Himalayan states include India, Pakistan, and China. And as you know, they are not always best friends. What's interesting about this organization is you can go to their offices and you will see Indians, Pakistanis, and Chinese, and Bhutanese, and Bangladeshis, <laughs> and all the other countries, people from all those countries working together because they recognize their common interests. And so this was an example quite a few years ago of an organization where people recognize their common interests in mountain areas and that they really needed to understand and compare and disseminate information, uh, and this still is going on. The nice picture in the background, by the way, is from, from Nepal. It's from my sister, who's been into some much nicer parts of Nepal than I have. I've ever only ever been to the Kathmandu Valley. 1986 was the beginning of something called the World Glacier Monitoring Service. And as you can see, this then didn't just have one UN organization behind it, it had three. Well, in fact, more than three. Um, it had UNESCO, the UN Environment Program, UNEP, and the World Climate Research uh, Program, which brings together the World Meteorological Organization and UNESCO and ICSU, which is the, uh, an umbrella organization for, for scientists from different disciplines. What was it looking at? Well, I think the pictures tell the story, as they often do. On the left-hand side, we can see a painting from Switzerland of the end of the Rhone Glacier in 1806. And on the right-hand side, you see a photograph from 1973 from almost exactly the same place. And as you could see, uh, on the left-hand side, Swiss painters were very accurate in depicting their mountains. You can actually use their, their paintings to go back and you then re-photograph the same places and you can actually use them to measure. Okay, not beautifully to the nearest millimeter or atom, but uh, to, to a reasonable extent to actually see where things were. And really this monitoring service was one of the first uh, attempts globally to recognize what's happening to our planet, that we need to not just do lots of little case studies, but to do it at a global level 
bringing together our knowledge at that big scale, at the global scale of what's going on. In 1989, um, an important book was published. Um, it was written by these two gentlemen, who, who you can see here, who both turned 85 last year. And I was very lucky to have them both as my supervisors for my doctorate. Um, on the left-hand side uh, is Bruno Messerly, who's Swiss. And on the bottom right-hand side is Jack Ives, who is originally from Grimsby, but then moved to Canada in the States and then back to Canada. Their book, The Himalayan Dilemma, was trying to bust myths. And the big myth they were trying to bust was something called the theory of Himalayan degradation. And the story went like this. In the mountains of the, of the Himalaya, in countries like Nepal, there are lots of stupid farmers. They are very stupid because they over-cultivate their land. And when it rains in the monsoon, because they've messed up their land so much, you get lots of erosion, and you get cuts in their terraces, all that soil goes downstream into rivers, and it's wasted, and it goes down, and, and then you get big floods, and all that soil eventually ends up as islands in the Bay of Bengal. That was the story. And what's interesting is where the story came from and what they did with it. And I don't, I could give a whole lecture on that, and they probably do, but I'll just <laughs> let you watch the pictures and you have to listen to me. Um, what this story came from was natural scientists from Europe who went out to the Himalayas, to Nepal, just after the rainy season. And these geomorphologists from, actually from Britain or Germany, would go and they'd see these cuts in, in the nice terraces, which you can see a picture of here. And they'd measure them and they'd work out how much sediment had gone downstream, and they'd go home and write it up. They didn't talk to the farmers. <laughs> Now, a few years later, some anthropologists who do things a bit of a different way, they went to the same sorts of places. And they talked to the farmers, and they stayed there for quite a long time. And what they found out was that the farmers actually let the water of the monsoon come down and cut between the terraces because that moves the, the soil around. It sort of refreshes the soil in the terraces. It goes from one terrace to the other. And if you stay long enough after the monsoon, instead of seeing these cuts through the terraces, what you'll see is that the farmers will build them back up again. And if you come back three years later, there's absolutely no evidence whatsoever that there ever was damage through the terraces. So this uh, book was the beginning of a series of, of studies really saying, OK, here is a story, and we're going to disprove each piece of it. Okay, some pieces of it may be true here and there from place to place, but the big story of stupid farmers who let erosion happen and floods happen is wrong. And in fact, the main cause of floods in Bangladesh is rain in Bangladesh. <laughs> it's nothing to do with what happens upstream. So this was a very important book because it really showed the value of scientific research in understanding what seemed to be big problems, but actually maybe weren't as big when you started looking at them uh, carefully, and over a long time, and talking to local people, because that's something a lot of scientists often don't do, especially natural scientists. They go and measure things and look at things, but they don't understand the whole system. In 1991, those two gentlemen I showed there, and a few others including me, and I was the young one of the team at the time, uh, realized that the Rio Earth Summit in 1992 was going to be a real opportunity uh, to do something for the mountains and for mountain people. And so with the support from the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation, um, I showing their logo here, we met in a nice place uh, in the Swiss Alps, and we put together uh, some documents uh, to really get mountains on the agenda for the Rio Summit in 1992. What we produced was two documents, and I should have remembered to bring them from my office, but I'll just show you the pictures now. The one on the left-hand side is a relatively small brochure, an A4 brochure, with lots of pictures and not too many words, 
And on the cover, it has a picture of a really awful mountain disaster, which happened in the 1980s when um, an earthquake happened in Peru on Huascaran. It loosened a lot of the ice on top, which then came down as a great flood, and as you can see, made a, a, a big mess in the valley, and 18,000 people are buried in that. So that's a pretty awful story, which shows, in a way, how dynamic and fragile mountain areas are. So that was a compelling story to say these sorts of things about mountains. So that was the glossy brochure. The other side is a book which weighs about a kilogram, and we wrote, we put together in about a year uh, on, basically that was our state of knowledge about mountains as we had it at the time, region by region. And that was really the ammunition to get people at the Rio Earth Summit to include mountains on the agenda and to do something about it. And the outcome, um, sorry, I always get this wrong, two points that we made in this, these documents. The first one was that as far as we could guess, mountains and upland areas cover about 20%, one-fifth of the Earth's land surface, and 10% of the world's population depends on those mountain resources. Numbers like that are important for politicians. They like to have statistics to base their, their policies and decisions on. What came out of that lobbying, all that work, lots of meetings, discussions in corridors and bars and all sorts of places, um, which I wasn't, by the way, involved in, <laughs> um, was Chapter 13 of Agenda 21. There are 40 chapters in Agenda 21, which was really the blueprint for sustainable development uh, for for the late 19th, uh, 20th and early 21st century. And so chapter 13 is called Managing Fragile Ecosystems, Sustainable Mountain Development. Uh, I don't expect you to read all the details here. The point is not perhaps what's in it. The fact, the point is that it exists. Because once you have a chapter in a global document saying that mountains are important, that really does put them on the agenda, um, along with rainforests, oceans, um, climate change, etc. And so that was really a watershed on in putting mountains on the global agenda, not just with the scientists, which is what I showed you previously, but really on the political agenda. What happened a couple of years later then is that for each chapter of Agenda 21, a different UN organization was given the responsibility for taking forward what was in the chapter. And so FAO, the Food and Agriculture Organization, uh, based in Rome, that's its headquarters. Uh, it's probably the best place in Rome for having a, a nice coffee, coffee with a good view, because it's up on top of a hill. Um, it was Mussolini's Ministry of the Interior before. But anyway, that's where we had our meetings of what became called the Ad Hoc Interagency Network on Chapter 13, which is a horrible thing. Um, <laughs> And what's wrong, it's, what's more, it's not even correct, because it wasn't an interagency network. Interagency networks bring together UN agencies, and this one did, but it also brought together all sorts of other organizations working in mountains, because it was realized that to really get things happening about mountains, you couldn't just involve the big global organizations and governments, you, you needed to organ involve uh, non-governmental organizations, uh, NGOs, and so on. So this organization, this network met, and met quite a few times afterwards, and they said what we need is to continue the momentum by having some meetings about mountains. And so over the next few years, uh, there were a number of intergovernmental consultations. People from different governments came together in, uh, as you can see, four different meetings. A total of 62 countries across all those different meetings, plus the EU, which of course is not a country, and so you have to write it specially. Um, in Africa, in Europe, in Asia, and that includes India and China, so big countries, and in Latin America. And they all discussed what were the key issues for sustainable development in their mountains, what were the things that were really of key interest to them, uh, to the people living in their mountains, and to the people living downstream from the mountains. But in as well as those intergovernmental consultations, there were non-governmental consultations. And I'm just showing a couple of them here. 
One of them was on, on the left-hand side was an international meeting, which was the first time I went to Lima and discovered about all these interesting foods. Um, and out of that came, as you can see, a report sending recommendations to the United Nations Commission on Sustainable Development. Um, so really, we're keeping up the momentum, keeping it at the highest level that mountains were important. And out of that came something called the Mountain Forum, which was the first global network about mountains using that new thing, the internet, which was very new at that time. And for the next 15, 20 years, the Mountain Forum was really the place to go if you wanted to find out about what was going on in mountain areas, if you wanted to find other people working on the same topic as you in mountain areas, it pulled together all sorts of information. Um, things have moved on, it doesn't exist anymore really, um, but that was something that really used the internet very well for quite a long time. And then on the right hand side we had a meeting in Europe uh, for uh, non-governmental organizations and again recommended to the government uh, and to the European Union what the key issues in mountains were. And I just mentioned one thing about that consultation. Um, we sent out a questionnaire to uh, thousands of different organizations working in European mountains. And we got a 25% response rate. And those of you who are scientists will know that that's a very good response rate. But how did we do it? We sent it in their languages, in 18 different languages. Although there were 80 questions, they still replied. So for scientists, Social scientists among you, that's a trick. Make sure you get it to the people in the way that they're going to respond to it. 1996, um, climate change came out of the Rio summit with the Framework Convention on Climate Change. And then a series of reports have come out through the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, as I'm sure you've heard over the years. What's important about the second report, which came out in 1996, although 1995, is it had a mountain chapter in it. And so I'm just going to go through the links between mountains and climate change that were in that chapter and that we can still talk about today. So first one is coming back to the story we were talking about earlier, glaciers are disappearing. And this is one picture I don't need to tell you anything about it, the picture tells the story. Um, just to say, I could have put in a picture from Glacier National Park in the USA, which may be misnamed in about 30 years, because it may not have any anymore. But this is a better picture. Um, another thing about climate change and mountains is that it, I mean, glaciers provide excellent evidence of climate change, but something else in mountains also provides very good evidence of climate change. And this is actually perfect for this audience, because this is a story about the link between science and mountaineering. In the early 20th century, one of the top Swiss botanists really liked climbing mountains. And when he went to the top of a mountain, while he was eating his lunch or whatever he was doing up there, he would also measure the occurrence of the highest specimen of every species and how far it was from the summit. And he wrote that all down in a little book. And all those little books got stored somewhere in Switzerland for a long time, until the late 1980s, when a couple of young Austrian mountaineers, who also happened to be botanists, discovered them. And they said, well, wouldn't it be fun to go back and see if these species, these plants, are actually in the same place? They weren't. They moved up. And what they then could do was to look at all those movements up of the species, and then look at the climate records in the same areas, and you got a very nice correlation. So this was one of the early pieces of evidence that climate change was really happening, that the, the, the world was warming up, and as a result, plants were gradually moving up mountains over 80 years. What's come out of that now is a global network of places around the world where people have done this incredibly simple uh, science. You just measure the distance, and then you go back after a few years and you see if something's happened. The sad thing in this story, though, is that when we started the EU, the European funded project in 2002, we didn't think we would ever see the evidence, the statistically valid evidence of plants moving up in our lifetimes. And 15 years later, we have it, which really does show that the climate is changing. So plants do move. 
not necessarily the same individual, but the same species of found by your eyes. Another piece of evidence about climate change or one of the impacts is that it's going to cause extinctions and it already has caused extinctions. Um, this is a picture of a very beautiful looking golden toad. The sad thing is there are no more golden toads. They've all gone extinct. And whether that's just to do with climate or an interaction of climate and uh, organisms that give them diseases isn't entirely sure, but certainly climate change is one of the major factors. Another thing that climate change does to mountains is to melt the permafrost, the frozen uh, soil and rock that you have high up in the mountains be beneath where the, the, the steep places are. In most places, that permafrost is called permafrost because it remains frozen all year round. What's happening, though, with climate change is that permanently frozen ground is becoming not permanently frozen. It thaws in the summer. And what you have as a result, which this picture is meant to illustrate, is you get more landslides. That's a problem if you happen to live in an area where your road is crossed by a landslide path. And in this particular example, um, they used to have landslides about every 20 years. You can, uh, the local community could afford to clear those. Now they start coming every five or three years. That costs a lot more for the community. So if they want to stay there, how are they going to deal with this problem? Because you can't stabilize a whole mountain. Another issue with climate change in mountains is it's getting drier. We have fewer water, less water falling sometimes, and certainly it's going to evaporate more. And that's a huge problem in the uh, mountains of dry countries, such as Oman, where this picture is taken because that, mount, that water isn't important only in the mountains, but also downstream. And climate change is also linked to diseases. And I don't expect you to, to look through that whole model on the, on the right-hand side, but the point is this is temperature, and this is precipitation, and this is, those are factors in the life cycle of malaria mosquitoes, the, the mosquitoes that carry malaria. Um, if it gets hotter, you get bitten more. If it gets wetter, they can breed very nicely. And what we're finding with climate change is that malarial mosquitoes are now moving up higher into the mountains, for instance, in Kenya and the Andes. And that's a problem because in the past, in tropical countries, mountains used to be healthy places to live. And now they're becoming less healthy places to live. So either people will have to move higher or we have to find ways to control mosquitoes, which fortunately we are doing. If we want to understand the future of climate change, though, we need to be able to uh, have models to that, that can predict the future or try to predict the future. The problem is that the models don't work incredibly well for mountains. They work quite nicely for flat parts of the world, but not for mountains. And these two pictures show up on the top left the USA, the 48 states of the USA, has the most used climate models uh, recognize it, with very large grid cells of 480 kilometers on each side, which basically smooth out all those mountains of the Rockies and the Sierra Nevada and so on, and the Cascades. The better models, which are beginning to be able to be used, have a grid cell of 60 kilometers, like you can see here, which give a much better representation of what the terrain is like. The point is that if your model doesn't actually see what you want to understand, it's not going to predict things very well about it. And what's even more important in some ways is that to make a model work, you need good data to start the model running. And then we have another problem, which is that although we have um, quite a lot of data at uh, lower altitudes, as you go up, which is to the right on this graph, which is unfortunate, it would be better the other way around, um, as you go up, you have fewer and fewer data. So to validate your model, to make your model work, you're relying on less and less accurate information. So predicting the future of climate change in mountain areas is a pretty dodgy subject, I would say, especially for, t uh, for, for, for temperature, uh, but even more for precipitation, because we have even fewer data. But climate change in mountains isn't necessarily all a bad thing. Um, and at least it might, in the long term, it might be a very bad thing. But in the short term, it, it perhaps can bring benefits. 
if you happen to be the uh, operator of a train company and you get less snow in the mountains because it's warming up, you have to spend less money on clearing the snow away. So um, I'm just using this picture to say, well, if this was 20 years ago and now it's today and we don't have the snow and our trains can all run on time, that is a benefit. Another potential benefit for those involved in tourism in mountain areas is that uh, people won't want to stay at very hot uh, places down in, near the sea in the summer, they'll come to the mountains. So that may be a benefit. So there are benefits potentially from climate change in a certain time period. Over the long period, probably not good. And I think the other point that I suppose this picture does show is that it's not just averages in climate change we need to worry about, it's the extreme events that we really do need to worry about. Bigger snowfalls, bigger droughts, bigger thunderstorms, bigger everything. Uh, and I think that's really what we do need to worry about in climate change. Coming back to my timeline then, in 1997, two more documents, uh, again, to say how important uh, meet, uh, mountains are at the Rio Plus Five meeting. Again, we produced two documents, but we learned from the previous ones. The first one on the left, again, was colour, but it's a much nicer looking product. It also had much more glossy pictures, uh, nicer pictures and fewer words, because we've learned that when you want to get the message through to UN uh, bureaucrats and other people in the delegations, the more nice pictures and the clearer story you have, the better. And I can see an editor in the uh, audience smiling about that. Um, so that was one of them. On the other hand, we really need to have the evidence because the people who make the decisions have staff members who they tell to go out and read all the evidence. So we produced a two kilogram book this time instead of a one kilogram book, um, which was much better than the other one because we'd had a lot more time to put it together. And for a long time, really, that has been the state of knowledge uh, document on mountains. So again, trying to keep the, uh, the uh, understanding of mountains uh, being important at the global level. In 1998, the UN General Assembly passed a resolution for an international year of mountains. So all this lobbying was working. What's interesting again, though, is that it was sponsored by 130 countries, which is the most countries that ever had sponsored such a resolution. And they included countries like the Netherlands, which is not famous for its mountains, or as Tom mentioned, Belgium. <laughs> um, so it was clear that a lot of countries, governments from a lot of countries had got the message that mountains were important. And one of the reasons for that is that at the Commission on Sustainable Development, CSD that year, <coughs> mountains, uh, water was on the agenda. And this is one of the real important values of mountains. Um, they've been called the water towers of the planet. As most of you know, one thing that really characterizes mountains is that they are wet. They are rainy places. Um, and those of you who have studied geography know about the orographic effect. The, the clouds rise, and when they get high enough, they drop stuff. Um, and sometimes it's water, and sometimes it's snow. And why is it important that sometimes it's snow? Because that's being a storage. It's storing water up high in the mountains for the long term, the, the long seasonal term. And in the spring, it then melts, and that water is available to whoever needs it downstream. And it can be used for many purposes. It can be used in the mountains, in a small-scale irrigation system, like uh, here in Hunza in Pakistan. Or, looking at a much larger part of Pakistan, it can be used to feed the largest irrigation system in the world, which is in the Indus Valley. And this is a, a picture borrowed from the Pakistani uh, space agency. And as you can see, uh, all those, uh, the whole river network is all rising in the mountains. Um, on one side, that's good that you have that water. On the other side, as you know, it also is a risk because you can have floods coming out of the mountains, and then you do have damage coming down as a result of the floods, and as I said, more and more extreme events with climate change. So there are goods and bad sides uh, of mountain water. The mountain water isn't only useful 
has water, but of course has a source of energy. Um, this being an example from Switzerland, uh, a dam that was built in the 1930s um, to provide energy for the large cities down in the Swiss lowlands. Um, what's interesting about this is it's one of the first examples of what nowadays is called payment for ecosystem services. In other words, paying people for something that the environment that they live in is providing. And what was realized was that when you flood a valley like this, you are the people living there are losing something. They're losing their grazing land and their fields. But the people down in the valley are getting their energy. And so ever since then, in the 1930s, the people in this valley have been paid by the people in the cities for the loss of their grazing land. They are now actually quite well off. <laughs> um, and there are similar stories actually in, in Norway as well, which is one of the, another country that, that has this, this sort of scheme. And some places you wouldn't even think about it necessarily depend completely on mountain water, although they're not very near the mountains. This is Los Angeles. Um, Los Angeles has been able to develop to the size and scale it, it is because water is piped from the other side of the Sierra Nevada, um, which has not had good effects on the local water uh, and rivers in the Sierra Nevada, but is good for people in Los Angeles. So the links between the mountains, the highlands, and the lowlands are very important in, in many places. Moving along then, 2000. You remember that in 1992 at the Rio Earth Summit, we said about 20% of the Earth's land surface was mountain. By 2000, we had satellites that were going around the planet and allowing us to measure the average altitude of everything on the planet. And that was recorded for every square kilometer, um, which creating something called the digital elevation model. And using that information, we could then put a number of rules about how high or steep or rough the terrain had to be to be a mountain. Those rules, those criteria were agreed between scientists, policymakers, and mountaineers. Um, and what you can see is that as a result, using those rules, which I could go into in more detail if you're interested, uh, we came up with the conclusion that a quarter of the land surface, 24%, is covered by mountains, including parts of Scotland, I'm sure you need to know. Um, and that has been a critical map, again, from a political point of view, because to say that a quarter of the surf alert land surface of the, of the planet is covered by mountains is something showing that mountains are important. And once you know where, on, in a big computer uh, database where the mountains are, you can then start overlaying other databases like population databases on it. So we again had new global population databases and overlaying those two then allowed us to show that a quarter of the world's population are in and around the mountains and 12% are uh, just in the mountains. Um, I won't go into that. The 26% relates to the use of a bigger grid square but it also makes the point that just around mountain areas are actually some of the most highly populated parts of the planet. Um, typically, um, just on the edges of mountains, for instance, in Europe, you get a lot of big settlements. Um, and it's not until you get way out onto the plains that you find the other big cities. And those people, as it's shown by these pictures, some of them are in rural areas, but some of them are in large cities, like Mexico City here on the right. 2002, you remember in 1998, there was a resolution for the International Year of the Mountains. 2002 was the year of the International Year of the Mountains, with a nice strap line, we are all mountain people, um, because we are all affected to some extent by what happens in the mountains. And as happens usually with these international years, lots and lots of things happened. Uh, 78 countries had committees deciding what to do, and producing all sorts of reports and organizing all sorts of events. Uh, and those went on, and you can anything you can imagine to do uh, with uh, mountains happened. There was uh, cheese meetings, there were sports meetings, there were musical meetings, there were events all over the planet, and global meetings. And out of uh, one of those last global meetings came a, a resolution, uh, again, to the General Assembly 
which was one of many that happened over the next few years. So this again was a, a year to really increase the, uh, the visibility of mountains at the national and international level by bringing together all sorts of people with an interest in mountains. The same year was also 10 years after Rio, and this one was called the World Summit on Sustainable Development, and it took place in Johannesburg. And what, from a mountain point of view, apart from the fact that there is one small mention about mountains in the final document, is that something called the Mountain Partnership was created. And it kind of grew out of this horrible thing I mentioned earlier, or horrible name thing, the Ad Hoc Interagency Network. Now it became the Mountain Partnership, and that still exists with a lot of governments, organizations, and businesses, over 200 of them all around the world, who are working together on different projects uh, to recognize or, or work towards the sustainable development of mountains. 2004, the CBD, the Convention on Biological Diversity, uh, decided it should have a program of work on mountain biodiversity. And this then brings me to another value of mountains, which is that they are some of the global <coughs> hotspots of biodiversity. If your geography is Europe, uh, geography of Europe is, is good, you will recognize that nearly all those dots are on mountains. And the dots, the red ones, show where there's a lot of species. The blue dots show where there's species which are endemics, in other words, ones that only are in very restricted places, and the green ones are places with both. So really, in Europe, mountains are centers of biodiversity. And that's true also at the global scale. This is a map that shows the number of plant species for each uh, 10,000 square uh, kilometer grid cell. And again, you can see going from left to right, from Central America down the Andes, and also <coughs> Brazil, South, America, uh, South Africa, <coughs> Cameroon, um, and then moving over to Asia, the Himalayas, and a lot of Southeast Asia. Nearly all of those red and purple areas are mountains. Why is that? Because mountains are places with a lot of diversity of habitats. As someone has said, you know, that the climate changes from, from in a very short distance. You can go just a few kilometers in a mountain area, and it's the same as going thousands of kilometers on the plain. You also have lots of different uh, aspects, north, south, east, west, uh, so very different microclimates. Um, species get left over after ice ages. And finally, um, mountains tend to be less developed. People haven't done as much agriculture, so plants and animals can survive there. So for all those reasons, mountains are centers of biodiversity. This is one example. This is the Tatra uh, in Slovakia. But equally, in the tropics, tropical mountain rainforests are actually, by some measures, more biologically diverse than tropical lowland rainforests. Because you're in lumpy terrain. You're in mountains. And so over a short distance, you get a huge change in your potential habitats. And the species, this biodiversity, has all sorts of values uh, for various purposes. You can either look at them, or you can shoot them, if that's what you happen to like to do. Um, this is a mountain goat, which wasn't shot, by the way. Um, we have interesting plants that are really uh, only found in mountain areas. Uh, David asked me why. I'm not st still that can't explain why these uh, particular things grow there, but they do, and they are very characteristic of mountain areas. These are Senecios, uh, in on Mount Kenya. You also get charismatic, characteristic plants, such as Edelweiss from Sichuan in China. Um, but to maintain that biodiversity, sometimes it's completely natural. But sometimes, because people have been using those environments for a very long, long time, you need to keep that human use going. And these gentlemen here are not farmers, which you might think. They're actually landscape gardeners in the National Park in France. And their job is to keep the height of the high grass down so that low-growing species can survive. So they're basically being paid to do what used to be done when people were cutting the hay in order to maintain populations of particular species. And biodiversity isn't just nice to look at or to enjoy uh, from, uh, uh, from a scientific point of view. It can be good for your health. Um, 
two examples here. One is uh, on the left-hand side, a lady from uh, Nepal with medic medicinal herbs collected from the forest. And herbs from mountains are the basis of a multi-billion dollar or pound economy. Um, Chinese medicine very much relies on mountain uh, herbs and other plants. Um, Back to my story of who benefits, well, usually the people who collect them don't get very much. The middlemen most, make most of the money. On the other side, if you like mount, uh, mushrooms, uh, mountains are very good places to grow many types of mushrooms. And an interesting story related to this one, which is from, from uh, the, the Italian Apennines, is that mountain mushrooms actually are very high value. And if you think about it, if you col collect your mushrooms every year for 100 years, you can get some money for that, that can be worth more than the value of the trees in the forest they're growing in. So it makes you think about forests in a different way, that actually the mushrooms are worth more than the wood. Again, very big industry. 2005 was something called the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment, and this big report, and in fact a series of big reports were published, and again, they're just like with the climate change report in 1995, <laughs> Mountains had a special chapter. Some of what was in that report is similar to what I've already said, but um, this is again the example I mentioned earlier, the fragility uh, point that mountain ecosystems really are very fragile places. They're, they're very dynamic landscapes. Things happen uh, dramatically, um, unfortunately, <laughs> with negative results, as we know from Italy recently. Um, so that's one aspect of mountains. Another one is this concept of ecosystem services, that we need well-maintained mountain landscapes. And I, to, to provide all sorts of goods to, to us in, in society as a whole. And I use this picture because if you look at the back, you see some very stripy uh, forest. In the European mountains in the Alps and, and the Vosges and other places in the 19th century, Forests were being cut down very rapidly, and the foresters were saying, look, this isn't a good idea. You're going to get lots of floods. And what happened was lots of floods. Um, so they then said, well, if you want to have fewer floods, you need to plant them. And that's an example of plantation forest from a, a lower mountain area. So this is one of these ecosystem services, which is becoming recognized more and more as one of the key values of mountain areas. In fact, I could probably completely reorganize this whole talk and put it in the context of mountain uh, of ecosystem services. Um, the problem is it's not an easy uh, concept to explain um, in many places. But the point is that all sorts of ways of managing the landscape really help us uh, live in terms of water, in terms of biodiversity, in terms of uh, healthy ecosystems. Another point made by the Millennium Ecosystem ass Assessment is that Poverty and ethnic diversity are higher in mountain regions, and people are often more vulnerable. Um, people in mountain areas are often pushed. The people that you find there, they are remnant populations. They are living there because they're different from the rest of the people, the majority in their countries, China being a good example. Um, the two pictures I've used here are from Papua New Guinea, because that's the place with the greatest cultural diversity, ethnic diversity in the world. It also has some of the highest biological diversity, and equally in the Andes. <coughs> Mountains often represent political borders and are refuges for minorities and political opposition. I think you all know that story, um, but I use this picture because it's at least a sort of happy ending. This is on the French-Italian frontier, and of course, at the time these fortresses were built, this was an area of real uh, conflict. Of course, now it's just a border in the EU, um, and they don't know quite what to do with these nice buildings, but that's a different story. But around the world, mountains often are places of conflict, and that's often because they are the places where people who are different are, are living. And the fact that getting through them is also one of the big challenges for security, that often getting through the mountains is very different, difficult. Um, this is the, the pass going over from Pakistan uh, into China. Not my picture, I'm afraid. And finally, well, almost finally, 
it's important to think about these linkages between the highlands and the lowlands because if you can recognize those connections, that improves sustainability for the long-term future for both the people in the mountains and the people downstream. I'm using this picture because this is partly where I used to live in Calgary, but over in, uh, in the distance you can see the Rocky Mountains, which is where all, all the water is coming from and where people from Calgary go for their skiing and their hiking. But the problem of all of these uh, statements I've been making is that they are generalizations and we often don't have really good data and information. In Europe, we have reasonable information in the Alps, uh, and, but the further we go from the Alps into uh, the, the Balkans, the Carpathians, and then into other parts of the world, we have less and less good data and not that good uh, spatial resolution. The reason I'm showing this picture is to show that the, the level at which you collect your data really influences what you can get out of it. So the two maps there are both using exactly the same data. The difference is that the one on the left shows the values of this particular, these, well, this economic uh, density, the earning power of people, at the level of municipalities. And here, for each, for each region, they've averaged the values of all the municipalities within the region. And so you lose a lot of the, 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 uh, the detail when you average the data. The problem is that for most mountain areas, we only have data of this sort of resolution, at this sort of scale. And so the mountains are often averaged out with the lowlands. And so to make good policies, you need good evidence, good data, but we just don't have it. So now just coming to the last few years, as I said, there have been more resolutions supporting sustainable mountain uh, development. Uh, there was even one last year. Uh, so the UN General Assembly has got the message and is keeping to recognize this message by passing more resolutions on uh, sustainable mountain development. UN conventions, the Climate Change Convention, the UNFCCC has uh, talked about climate change quite a few times, um, and I'm just illustrating that with a couple of uh, reports that have been produced for these meetings. The CBD, the Convention on Biological Diversity, has also, as I said, recognized uh, mountain biodiversity as a key issue. And another one which you may not have heard of before, the UNCCD, that's the UN Convention to Combat Desertification, has recognized the fact that many mountain areas are in dryland areas. And as I said, that's place, those are where the, the value of mountains as water towers is particularly important. Um, up to 95% of the amount of the water in dryland areas. We've also seen um, interesting groups of countries getting together, recognizing the importance of mountains and of, of joining and having a common cause. And if you look at that group of mountains in under the first bullet, you might say, what do all of those countries have in common? Well, they have mountains. And so although you wouldn't necessarily think of them as pr pr being in a block or being a lobby group or anything, they've actually got together because they are concerned with climate change. They want to share information, they want to increase research, um, they want to do something about climate change. And then equally, these three mountain landlocked countries, Armenia, Kyrgyzstan, and Tajikistan, have also been active in the UN to try and promote the, 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 um, the cause of mountains. 20 years after the Rio meeting in 1992 was uh, Rio plus 20. Um, to prepare for that, there was a special conference on uh, sustainable mountain development in Lucerne in Switzerland. And out of that, again, came uh, a lot of uh, work to try and make sure that uh, at the Rio Plus 20 meeting, the final document, just like with Agenda 21, would again mention mountains. There wasn't a chapter this time, there were three paragraphs, but that was seen again as, as a success, um, three paragraphs in 400 or so, 1%. Uh, but it's still, the point is not what's in them again, but they're there. They are recognized, and to get paragraphs to get words into these big documents is not easy. So you need a lot of government supporting you. You need a lot of work behind the scenes. And again, coming back to one more last report, uh, back in 
back in the uh, in the in the ninth uh, early in, in 19, 20, 1992 and then 2000 we had estimates of mountain people. We now have actually a higher percentage of the global population living in mountain areas than we used to do. People are moving into the mountains. Most of those people are living in developing countries. And as you can see, there has been a lot of growth in mountain populations in Africa and in Latin America and the Caribbean. What's worrying is that a lot of those people are vulnerable to food insecurity. They don't have enough to eat and are unlikely to have enough to eat. And the proportion of those has increased quite a lot uh, in the last 15 or so years. So that's something quite worrying, that although governments have been recognizing the issues, there are still quite a lot of problems. And uh, in 2015 also, um, you may have heard about the Sustainable Development Goals, which are the latest version following up from the Rio Summit and Agenda 21. We now have the uh, Sustainable Development Goals. And again, after a lot of lobbying behind the scenes, three of those do specifically uh, relate to mountains and mention them, uh, and those are the ones here. I'm not going to read through them, but really, again, relating to water-related ecosystems, freshwater ecosystems, mountain biodiversity, and the different benefits that that provides. So to finish, I'm going to conclude with this picture. Um, it, it may not look like a particularly interesting mountain, but I, it tells a lot of the stories that I've been telling in the last few minutes. It's the highest mountain on the border between the Czech Republic on the right-hand side and Poland on the left-hand side. Um, as you can see, it's a sacred mountain. It has a church on the top of it. It's also a place where scientific research has been going on on the left hand side is an observatory where they collect all sorts of data in fact it's the longest record for high altitude climate in europe um, it's a frontier and the water that falls on the left hand side goes uh, north and the water on the falls on the right hand side in the czech republic goes south so it's a watershed uh, it's also quite fragile as you can see lots of people have been wandering up on down on the czech side uh, and have really got rid of most of the vegetation, whereas on the Polish side they managed to keep the vegetation in reasonably good shape. Because it is an area of high biodiversity. This is a national park on both sides. So this mountain is a kind of microcosm of a lot of the points I've been making over the last, uh, last while in this talk. And I hope that you will agree that do, mountains do matter. And thank you very much for your attention. And as was mentioned earlier, there is a book which tells a lot of these stories in a great more detail than I've done this evening. Thank you very much. <laughs>